Joyce, I, I, I want to start with the, with the thing that, to me, uh, maybe I'm just a simpleton, but, man, 12 boxes. I don't know if that, if, if I'm, what I'm supposed to read from that. I mean, when they brought 15, when we discovered that Donald Trump, there were 15 boxes of things that weren't supposed to be there earlier this year, we said, man, that's a lot of boxes for a guy. You know, he, he obviously took a bunch of stuff he wasn't supposed to take. That's a lot of stuff. It, it seems like, I, I don't know what the inference to draw from 12 is. Does 12 suggest that they're looking for a lot of stuff, or does it suggest that they, they, did, they did this search quickly, or so quickly that they were like, we're not going to like see if we're looking for one thing that could be in 12 different places. I'm just not clear about whether we should be stunned by its 12 more boxes, or does that not surprise you at all? Well, I think you're right, John, when you say it's not clear, because the reality is it's not at all certain what to read into that. But maybe one way of looking at this that's helpful is that there are two primary concerns about classified documents. Those are spills and spoliation. And what that means is you're worried about spills of classified information when important material that could impact the national security is not just, you know, let's just say lost euphemistically here down in Mar-a-Lago, but if it were being transferred into other hands that put the country in danger. That's the sort of thing that might lead you to search. And then, of course, the risk of spoliation of, of evidence being destroyed. That's the sort of thing that will get folks jumping pretty quickly to execute a search warrant. But we don't have a basis here for understanding whether this is a national security exercise or part of a criminal investigation, maybe down the road, a criminal prosecution. Twelve boxes, if that reporting holds up, is an awful lot of documents for someone to have held on to after they've been in conversations with DOJ for a long period of time about the need to return classified material. Right. I mean, it's like this thing of like, you know, the Trump kids are on TV saying, you know, you know, our dad just he liked to have like newspaper clippings and he had a, he had a great scrapbook. Like, I don't know why they're asking him for anything, but man, it seems like with 12 boxes, they were looking for, they maybe have been looking for more than one thing. Joyce, you know, the, the, sticking with you, this is a thing because of your background that I've been eager to talk to you about all day. There's all these people out there, some, I think, uh, in bad faith and some in good faith, saying the DOJ needs to be more transparent. This is a historic thing. It's unprecedented. The public needs to know there's conspiracy theories whipping around that the right is, is fueling. There are people of goodwill who want to understand what, like, what is the basis for this, right? And they say the DOJ needs to come clean. Tell us what they, why they're doing this, uh, what the investigation's about, what evidence they have, et cetera, et cetera. And I find myself saying... That's not DOJ policy. We got mad at James Comey for talking about an ongoing investigation. They, the DOJ policy says don't talk about it. So I'm curious what your thoughts are about it. Is this case so unusual that they should break that policy? Or do you think they should stick to the policy of keeping their mouth shut unless they charge Donald Trump? Well, look, it's frustrating. It would be great if Merrick Garland would come out and take a podium this afternoon and tell us exactly what's going on. But there are good reasons, solid reasons behind DOJ's policy of not commenting on ongoing investigations. And that involves protecting criminal defendants. That involves this notion that in our country, everyone is innocent until they're proven guilty. So I was really taken aback by the people, especially the political folks who wanted to know, you know, what's going on here? Tell us the details. And can you imagine if at this stage DOJ said, well, we're not sure if we're going to charge anyone, but here's all of our evidence that says that the former president was involved in criminal conduct. And here's the probable cause we had to believe we'd find evidence of those crimes in his home. That's what, as a prosecutor, I'd call dirtying somebody up in the press. And that's what happens in countries that are failed democracies or countries that don't aspire to democracy. Here, DOJ charges people in charging documents and it puts on its evidence in a court of law where there are strict rules about what evidence is admissible against someone who's been charged with crimes. Those protections are really important. And if we're going to put those by the wayside in a case involving the former president, well, I suspect if that were to happen, say this afternoon from a podium somewhere, we'd hear a lot of complaints about the unfairness to Trump. But also there's no reason to abandon these sorts of cherished principles. DOJ can go out and talk about process, and Merrick right. Garland does a good job of that, explaining how he investigates cases without talking about the substance of a specific case. You know, Kurt, you've been writing about Donald Trump for a long time, um, short-fingered Bulgarian, um, uh, a spy magazine, which you once co-edited, uh, called him. You know, I, I, yesterday, the DOJ did not make this public. 
That was not, they did not publicize this, this, this search of, the, of Mar-a-Lago. Donald Trump did. And it seems to me, for the reasons that the Joyce is kind of implying, that that's what this is all about. Trump, Trump took this public because he thought it was in his interest to not just to spur these conspiracy theories, but then to put pressure on the DOJ. What would they say? There's nothing they could say that wouldn't that Donald Trump and the right wouldn't make part of their narrative. They'd be attacked for breaking with policy. They'd be attacked for dirtying up Donald Trump, no matter what the words that came out of their mouth are. Well, and let's remember, these dozens of FBI agents arrived at Mar-a-Lago yesterday, early in the morning. He had all day to discuss, consider how best to exploit, and I believe as well as all the reasons you gave, to monetize this. By the end of the day, he, he had he was raising money off of this, so it took him all day, perhaps, to, to to figure out exactly how best to exploit this. And as you say, put the government in this terrible position of accusing them of, and along with the right wing talking points that were distributed, to well, what is this all about? This is wrong. This is they're smearing him by 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 even going in there all day. Uh, but then, as Joyce says, of course. The smear would be if they if they gave their evidence. I, I had one question for Joyce, if you don't mind. Which what is? They were there for ten hours. They, they got twelve boxes. Doesn't that? I've never been at a, at a, as, uh, at a day long search warrant execution. Does that mean they looked through the boxes or just pointed at boxes and grabbed them? Joyce, go ahead. Yeah, so some of it will depend upon what they were authorized to do in the search warrant. But typically the reasons these searches take a while is that you'll go in, um, the agents running the search will try to talk with folks on the ground about what's there and, and they may show them the warrant or explain what they're looking for. Assuming that there's some level of cooperation between um, the folks involved, then it enables them to go in and then um, take what they're looking for. You know, it takes a lot of time to go through 12 boxes of documents, and I don't think that's the kind of thing that you can do even in a 10-hour search. There are also concerns here about taint and privilege. Mostly what you want to do in a case like this is secure the materials and then take them off-site so that you can have any sort of filter review that you need to have before agents and prosecutors involved in the case itself are taking a look at them. And of course, here there's an additional layer of national security concern. So my suspicion would be that in large part, the, the time that they spent involved identifying likely materials and then removing them. Uh, Jackie, I just wanted to do a fact check with you real quickly, because you're covering this story more carefully than anybody else on this panel right now, really like, like second by second, moment by moment. Has anybody on Donald Trump's team come out and said in an emphatic, clear way, there were no classified documents at Mar-a-Lago since this happened? No, not at all. And, and we know that not to be true. We also uh, know that we've asked many of his advisors and people who were at Mar-a-Lago and present for the, the execution of the search warrant um, for the the actual an actual copy of that request. Uh, as of just a, a few hours ago, maybe not even an hour ago, um, the magistrate judge Reinhardt, who uh, is the judge that signed off on, on the search warrant, um, is asking for the DOJ to actually unseal the request uh, uh, for the Mar-a-Lago warrant by August 15th. Um, so that could also provide some transparency in, into the process here. There was also a detailed inventory that should have been left behind with former President Trump by investigators. Although uh, the, the problem there is that if there was classified information taken, which is um, likely to have happened since we know that was part of the reason why they executed the search, you know, investigators wouldn't even be allowed to, in some cases, write down very specific um, words or descriptions of these items taken because of their classification. Right. I think it's helpful to think about the first uh, loot or the first tranche of, of boxes, those 15 boxes that were taken in February, uh, in January of earlier this year by the National Archives, and what we know about those. Um, in, in those boxes, again, 15 were taken. We know uh, that the inventory that was created of those boxes in 
one of the inventories of the unclassified items, it was over 100 pages long. And we know that the inventory of classified items uh, was roughly three pages long. And some of those items um, were the, the highest classification, top secret, and actually required special handling. Um, yeah. But again, even in that version of that inventory that our sources informed us about, the descriptions were fairly vague in order to protect the, the secrecy.